Hello, H Civil War subscribers, and welcome to another edition of the Civil War Era and Digital Humanities interview series. I'm your host, Chase McCarter, PhD student in history at the University of New Mexico and resource editor for H Civil War. In this episode, H Civil War explores the world of podcasting, and we talk with Dr. Keith Harris about his two popular podcasts, the Rogue Historian podcast and the Civil War Letters of Henry A. Allen podcast, as well as a little bit about Keith's website, keithharrishistory.com. So a little bit about my guests in this episode. Uh, Dr. Keith Harris is a historian and educator who currently lives and works in Hollywood, California. He holds a PhD in United States history from the University of Virginia and has taught courses in United States history at the University of Virginia, the University of California at Riverside, and he currently teaches at a private high school in Los Angeles. Dr. Harris's work focuses on 19th and 20th century American history with a special emphasis on the Civil War Reconstruction, Historical Memory, The Progressive Era, and National Reconciliation. His first book, Across the Bloody Chasm, The Culture of Commemoration Among Civil War Veterans, is available from the Louisiana State University Press. Dr. Harris is currently researching for a new project on the making of the controversial silent film, The Birth of a Nation. All righty, so without further delay, here is my conversation with Dr. Keith Harris. I hope you all enjoy all right, Keith, um, thank you so much for taking some time today to join H Civil War to talk about your podcast, The Rogue Historian, and to talk about your website also, uh, keithharrishistory.com. Yeah, sure, man. It's really, uh, it's really great to, to be on. Nice to see it. Right. So I, I guess I wanted to start it um, to talk a little bit about the, the background of the Rogue Historian podcast. Um, from what I could tell, the pot, you've been doing this podcast for a while now, roughly five years, around 2016 is when you first started doing it. Mm -hmm. so Something like that, yeah. I'm just interested in, um, you know, what made you want to do a podcast? You know, how did the idea to come up come up to do a to a history themed podcast? Well, that's a really good question. You know, I'm um, uh, I am part of a group of people I think that got started uh, in social media kind of early on uh, among historians. I was still in grad school when I, you know, I got a Twitter account and uh, a Facebook account and then eventually an Instagram account and YouTube and all that stuff. And we were on kind of, you know, there's a bunch of people uh, uh, just sort of on the, 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 the cutting edge makes me sound like it, but, but, but it was kind of at the beginning of this, you know, early in the, uh, in the, in the 2010s uh, that, that, that we decided that, that engaging with the public was, you know, a super important thing to do. And things that, you know, members of the National Park Service and and, and people who, who work in the field of uh, museums and things like things have been doing for forever, you know, academic historians, uh, you know, branching out more into that field was really important to, to myself and a bunch of other people. And we, and we started blogging early on um, and blogging became a, a very popular medium uh, to discuss things with the informed public, as I call them, people who are well-read, uh, people who are, are, are very interested in history, but maybe aren't necessarily academic historians. And so, you know, we, we had the, we had these conversations in, in the kind of language that, you know, that works, that is assess, accessible to the, to the general public, you know, not academic language. Um, and, and it was great, you know, it was fantastic. And when, and when podcasting kind of took off, it seemed like the natural, you know, natural thing to do is to get into podcasting. And there were several people doing, there's a, there's a number of people who do, uh, who do excellent uh, podcasts. And, you know, uh, I kind of wanted to just, you know, talk to, talk to historians um, in, in, in accessible language about their work uh, and get that out to as many people as possible. And, um, you know, also, uh, so, so that's one part of the, of the, of my idea about the podcast when I first started doing it. And the other part was to, you know, as a, I'm, a, I'm a history teacher, uh, high school history teacher, um, and I teach at a private high school in Los Angeles. And I wanted to, you know, have a way for other high school teachers to get the latest scholarship on. I do a lot of Civil War stuff, but, you know, I do other things, too, uh, you know, in, in American history, all kinds of things that I've touched on on the podcast. Um, and I wanted them to have access to the latest scholarship and discuss ways with uh, with my fellow historians about how to bring their work into the classroom for high school students um and 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 get have have high school students have a chance to really you know kind of sink their teeth into some of the latest stuff uh latest stuff that's coming out uh I'm a, you know for example i most recently did a, a thing on, on the so-called dark turn uh in civil war history this is something that you know this is discussed in, in academic circles and various other things and there's debates on whether on the value of it even and, uh, and i i happen to think it's rather interesting uh and rather valuable uh, to talk about and so i bring that 
that new scholarship into the classroom, that new debate into the classroom. And I want to share that with my fellow history teachers so they can re, you know, duplicate that process and bring it into their classrooms as well. So I kind of think of this as a resource. I've even assigned a, a few of my podcast episodes, the ones where I you know, don't use bad language <laughs> uh, to, to my students uh, from time to time. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned um, that this kind of started out of your uh, blogging background. Mm -hmm. I think when I, when I interview people about their digital humanities project, there's been a couple that have had a common, um, common origin point that this kind of emerged out of their uh, blogging background. Um, you buzzed a couple of questions there in your answer that I want to get to a little bit later, but I want to, cool. um, I kind of want to just, for people who may not be familiar with the podcast, you mentioned kind of a little bit what the podcast is about and what it, what it focuses on, but kind of, you know, what is the focus topically of the, of the podcast? And, you know, in addition to interviews, I know you do book reviews sometimes. So if you could just talk a little bit about kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the focus and scope of the podcast. Yeah, well, sure. Well, you know, my, my area of expertise is the American Civil War and Reconstruction. I, you know, um, that's, uh, that's been where in my career as a professional historian, I've, I've dealt uh, primarily with that and, and specifically studying veterans and commemoration. So I know a lot of that literature and I engage with a lot of the scholars who also touch in those fields. So I often bring those folks onto my show. So there are, I would say, probably 75% of the episodes um, that I've put out in the past have some connection to the Civil War or Civil War memory, uh, especially a sort of niche field Civil War memory. And, and, and so there's that. But, but I have my interests are very broad. And as a, as a, as a teacher, I mean, I, I teach a, a survey course in, in United States history and honors course. And so I'm always, you know, um, looking for, uh, for, for new ways to introduce that stuff uh, into my classroom. So I seek out other scholars. Uh, I had Lindsay Chervinsky on the show, for example, uh, a while ago, who speaks about Washington's, uh, Washington's cabinet. That's not my field of expertise by any stretch, but it fascinated me. She wrote such a wonderful book. Um, and, I, and, and, and especially, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, current issues with, with you know, uh, cabinet members coming and going in the last administration and, and, you know, all this kind of interesting stuff about the cabinet. The cabinet is like in the news all the time. So I read this book and went, wow, this is really fascinating stuff, how we get to a to, a, to an executive cabinet. Uh, it, it, we take it for granted, but it, was, it really wasn't like that uh, in the beginning. And there was questions on whether or not Washington uh, should have even had that uh, uh, at his disposal, you know, what that meant for the, uh, for the executive branch of the, of the U.S. government. So I thought this stuff was great. And so I had her on the show, you know, have her on the show to talk about this. So anything that piques my interest, you know, uh, anything at all that piques my interest, uh, I'll have somebody on the show to talk about it. Though I, you know, since I, I spend so much time reading Civil War books, it tends to kind of, you know, it tends to kind of lean in that direction. And, um, you know, like you mentioned, I, I do uh, book reviews all the time. Um, and I, I write the book reviews, of course, publish them on my, on my website. But I also uh, record me reading the reviews uh, just as an additional way uh, to get that information out to folks, especially, you know, uh, folks who commute back and forth uh, from work, uh, you know, they're, they're in like little sh short snippets so you can easily digestible uh, little snippets that they can listen to on the way to and from work. I think that's when most people listen to podcasts anyway, when they're sitting in their car. And so I try to keep them, you know, what's the, what's the average commute to work 30 minutes or so I try to keep them 30 or 40 minutes. Sometimes they go longer and I break them up into two segments. Um, but uh, I try to keep them in, in that general in that general time frame. Now that's what I've been doing for the last five years, and it's been very successful. I've had um, I've had some 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 scholars that are that are new in the field and coming up and doing some new, innovative, uh, really interesting, cutting edge stuff. And I've had some some established scholars who have been sort of giants in their field for decades come on the show. So I've had you know a whole range of different. Uh, scholars, and I've even had, you know, folks that work in museums come on the show. I've had people that work in public history come on the show. I've had uh, living historians uh, come on the show. Uh, one of my, one of my, uh, my favorite episodes uh, that I did, I think last year or the year before, it was with uh, Robert Lee Hodge, um, the, the, the most famous Confederate reenactor who was featured in Tony Horowitz's uh, Confederates in the Attic. He's an interesting dude, man. Uh, and and I, it was fun having him on the show. So I have all kinds of people on that just, you know, uh, want to talk about. Sometimes I agree with them and sometimes I don't. And we have a real nice civilized, believe it or not, it's, uh, it's actually possible to have a civilized discussion with someone uh, with whom you disagree. And we have, you know, nice discussions about stuff. So uh, that's what I've been doing for the last uh, last five years. And this year, I've decided to take a bit of a, a bit of a turn and try something new, uh, which I'm debuting this summer. 
it's going to be a bit of it's a bit of a different format. I've been doing an interview interview style show, and that's uh, I think that's very fairly typical across the board with uh, with lots of different podcasts. And and, and this summer I'm going to take a different tack, and I'm going to take each episode and try to tell a story, uh, and 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 then bring in a number of scholars to offer uh, their their thoughts on particular points along the narrative. Uh, so, for example, I've been uh, I'm working on putting the, together a piece right now on the origins uh, and the legacy of the lost cause uh, Civil War history. Um, I'm working on another piece uh, trying to demystify, uh, as it were, those uh, who engage in living history uh, reenactors. Um, I think a lot of times reenactors are dismissed as weirdos. And, and honestly, I think, well, I know there's some peculiar folks who are in that hobby, but there are also some people who are very much dedicated uh, to teaching uh, the teaching history, the history of a common soldier in the Civil War or any con uh, conflict, for example, or, you know, teaching about the material culture of a soldier and, and, and they work in battlefield preservation. They do all kinds of things that are, I think, very valuable and very important. So I kind of want to sort of unsensationalize them and bring them down to earth and talk about what they actually do. So that's another show that I'm working on for the summer, but I should be uh, debuting these things sometime mid-June, maybe early July as I put them together. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and if that goes as well as I hope it will, then I'm going to continue forward in that mode. Uh, maybe have an interview, uh, a more a more typical interview episode on from time to time. But um, but then you know just keep forward like that. Yeah, it kind of what you're describing there kind of reminds me of um, you mentioned you did the the segments on the dark turn, and I think you had Sarah mm -hmm. Hanley Cousins on. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's on great on that podcast. They have the history podcast Dig, right, where they kind of mm -hmm. do something similar to that so no, that's yeah and, I, and dig is an excellent podcast and and and, and, and in many ways has serves as, as my inspiration for you know what makes a good podcast something like that you know they they tell a good story and that's and really you know if you can tell a compelling story uh you know you've you, you've you've won you've won the battle that's good and then bring scholars in to uh to comment on that yeah they there's their podcast is excellent so i guess kind of shifting to maybe a more broader question here, and and, and you mentioned it kind of in talking about your background with the in the background of the podcast and kind of your your goals for the podcast. Um, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on what you think of podcasting as kind of um, it's not an emergent medium, but I, but uh, a medium that maybe is kind of making its inroads into you know more academic circles. What what do you think its potential is for? academic historians i was reading a piece um from the aha not too long ago and the authors in that suggested that maybe even podcasting is the new um is the new op-ed that it's it's replacing mm -hmm. maybe that medium yeah i mean i think that there's unlimited potential in this medium you know i mean everybody hasn't has internet access for the most part um and you know with that kind of access it, it really sort of democratizes uh academia in a lot of ways because everybody has access to it. And, and podcasting, you know, really lends itself to having uh, accessible conversations. You know, a, a, a esoteric language infused podcast isn't gonna get you very far and nobody will listen to it. People will figure that out very quickly, right? Um, you know, those who are entering into it, you, if it's too up and, you know, up, way up here in the ivory tower, then, then nobody's gonna pay attention to it. And, you know, there, but, uh, you know, when, when, this, when this first happened, I mean, and, and the same with, with, with podcast, with blogging, uh, when these things first started coming out, there was a, a number of, of scholars who pushed back, you know, um, pushed back against this. And I'm, you know, without naming names, no point in doing that, but it, some pretty prominent folks pushed back against it, um, thinking that it was maybe, I don't know exactly what their thought process were, but it seems to me as sort of like, you know, kind of dumbing down the discipline a little bit. Um, and and, and, and I, I, I don't think that that's the case at all. In fact, if anything, I think it's bringing more people into the discipline. And so, um, you know, with, with so many people uh, interested in, in reading and understanding history, you know, a, the, the podcast is a great sort of neat way uh, to get that and to be able to engage with people that kind of goes beyond the, you know, the, 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 the social media noisemaking. Uh, that you see so much of, right? You see people go on with a meme and they'll, 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 they'll make some, you know, some noise and they'll, they'll, they'll weaponize history and, and try to use it to promote their agenda. You know, this, I mean, I guess you could do that with podcasts too, if you're, if you're one, if, if you're, you're so inclined, but honestly, I think anybody, any, any, any scholar uh, worth his salt or her salt is going to go on and, and, you know, uh, have a, have a real conversation about, uh, about their work uh, and, and, and in a way that, you know, that is open to, 
constructive criticism and then you know, publish that and be willing to talk to people uh, about stuff. I think that's a, a very healthy um, a very, very healthy way to, uh, to promote our work. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, in my first book, I, I thanked my social media following because we have these conversations and they've helped me, you know, rethink things uh, or think about things in different ways uh, than I have before, just because I'll put, I'll post a question out to the universe and, or, or, or through my, or my, through my podcast or what have you, and have people respond uh, with their thoughts, uh, with their insights, with their criticism. Um, and it's, it's maybe a, made me a better scholar personally and a better teacher personally. So I love this medium. I think it's unlimited potential. Um, of course, it can be used for evil, as can everything, right? Uh, and, and, I'm, and there are lots of people out there that I'm sure uh, are interested in doing that. But, you know, uh, they, I think that that's, um, you know, pretty transparent. Um, and anybody that's really earnestly interested in learning about history, you know, really learning about it, not promoting their narrow-minded agenda, but really learning about history can see through that stuff pretty quickly and just turn it off. Uh, and then, you know, seek out the people who are actually trying to, trying to afford, uh, trying to uh, expand knowledge, as it were. Yeah, and I mean, I think kind of going along with kind of what you said about engagement, one of the things that I really love about the Rogue Historian um, podcast is, you get into those uh, academic debates, right, that mm -hmm. are happening within the inner circles of academia that the general public, you know, may, may maybe the the really hardcore de devoted, you know, readers of Civil War history know about these, but, you know, like, you know, for example, you know, my, my parents have a mild interest in the Civil War, but they're not going to know the ins and outs of the, the dark turn debate, mm -hmm. but something like a podcast where they can sit down uh, for 30 minutes and, you know, um, listen to you talk to Sarah Henley Cousins or, or like in your episode with uh, Dr. Gary Gallagher, just kind of go through these developments and hear both sides. Um, it not only, I think, um, kind of just informs them about what's going on, but I think it also, you know, gives people a, a real indication of what history is, what historians do. Um, you know, it's not just kind of the facts and dates and telling the story, but it's debate and there's different sides to interpretation, right? Yeah, and I'm really glad you brought that up because I think sometimes people are operating under the false impression uh, that the history is just a you know it's, it's a series of events that happened in sequence, and here are the dates they happened on, and this is this is why, and 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 that's it in the end. Uh, that's not really it at all. And you mentioned and you mentioned Gary. I mean, you know, he used to say, and I remember I, I was a TA for him when I was at the University of Virginia, and he would say to his Civil War students, he goes, "If that were the case, there'd be one history book. We'd all read it." And then we move on, we move on. Uh, and, and that's just not it at all. I mean, historians, and what I like to tell my students is, you know, historians don't agree on anything, really. I mean, it's, it's very rare that we're in complete agreement. You and I might agree generally on stuff, but we might disagree on some of the finer points of, of what have you. And so, you know, the, the, the real beauty of that in, 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 is that we can sit down at the table and we can, you know, we can hash out our differences and try to see where there's common ground, or we can, you know, just, you know, we, we, we bring our evidence to the table and, and, and what I think these debates show to the general public is that there are multiple perspectives. Um, there's an enormous amount of evidence and you draw from, uh, you know, you draw from the archives and the way that you read this evidence uh, might, you know, might differ from the way somebody else reads the evidence, you know, and then and, and we bring that and we bring that to bear on our subject matter and we might come to different conclusions. Uh, and, and so we sit down and we try to figure out uh, you know, where we intersect uh, in, in, in our conclusions or, 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 or continue to disagree and just keep fighting it out, you know, which is also perfectly fine. Um, and, and, and if anything, you know, it just helps us understand the stuff better. Uh, you know, and, and, and I have a course on historiography that I teach to my most ambitious seniors in high school. And we talk about these historiographical shifts, uh, you know, that happen, you know, every, every 10 or 20 years or so. And and, and they're always so taken with how different things are, say, you know, an interpretation of, you know, an interpretation of Reconstruction 
uh, during, uh, you know, the, the Dunning School interpretation of Reconstruction, for example, versus a progressive uh, interpretation of, of Reconstruction versus, you know, some, something along the line, you know, it's something that comes out of, you know, from the new left out of the 1960s, that interpretation of Reconstruction. And they go, why is it, isn't it just, you know, isn't it just Reconstruction? Didn't things happen? And they go, well, yeah, things just happen. But the way you read into this is based a lot on your worldview and where you're coming from and, you know, uh, all these kinds of things. And, and they find that, that uh, they find that to be fascinating how this shifts over time and, and we'll continue to have historiographical shifts as we move through, uh, you know, as we move through the, the subsequent generations, uh, the generations that follow us, you know, we'll look back on my work and, and your work and everybody else's work and go, yeah, that, that was an interesting point, but they didn't really look at it this way because, you know, how could they have, blah, 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 right? And, uh, and then there'll be a new, whole new generation of people uh, that, that, challenge, that challenge our work. And, and I embrace that with all of my heart because all that means to me is that we're getting, uh, you know, we're, we're expanding our, our understanding, uh, we're expanding our base of knowledge, and, and we're having conversations about it. And to me, that's more important than, you know, I keep going back to this idea that, you know, uh, people weaponize history to promote their agenda. And that's something that, that, that irritates me to no end, as you can tell. It gets us out of that mindset, that, that, what, that, that that's what history is about. Um, it isn't about that to me. It's about understanding the truth. And if, if there is such a thing as a, the objective truth, which is questionable, but if there is such a thing as that, then we're trying to get it. And, and, and the effort is worth it, right? The effort is worth it. We may not ever get it, but it's, it's, it's something to which we can aspire. And, and, and I think we owe it to ourselves as scholars, if, if we are being intellectually honest, right? We owe it to ourselves to try to figure that out. And we may not ever do it. <laughs> You know, we might not ever understand, but we owe it to ourselves to try. Yeah, I think this, and also, you know, the, and I think there's a reason probably why you keep coming back to this idea of weaponizing, people weaponizing history. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's probably an understatement to say that it's like extremely topical right now mm -hmm. in our society, yeah. you know, especially, you know, everything that's been going on recently, right? Mm -hmm. in the news. Um, so, I want to shift away just from the, the Rogue Historian podcast sure. to talk about another, I guess, podcast is maybe what you would call it within mm -hmm. the realm of the kind of Keith Harris production world, <laughs> uh, um, which is the letters of uh, the Civil War letters of Henry A. Allen, which is mm -hmm. a podcast you can find, I'm assuming just kind of where on your website, Keith Harris history .com, mm -hmm. but also I think wherever podcasts are offered. Yeah. Yeah, anywhere that podcast you just search it and it'll come up. But but yeah, you can go to keithharrishistory.com and find it there. Right. So just um, for people who are unfamiliar, you know, um, who is Henry A. Allen and why did you want to, um, I guess, you know, enshrine him in a podcast? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he's probably he's probably uh, more famous because of the podcast than he ever was in his actual life. But so that's interesting. So Henry Allen is a, is a young uh, a Confederate officer. Uh, who served uh, in a Virginia regiment in the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, he's, he's, he's married, uh, has young children, um, and he works in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, in, uh, he, I, I, I had this all figured out through piecing together things. Uh, he works in shipping in, in some regard, in the, in the shipyards in some regard, working, working in that capacity. And he finds himself as a young officer uh, uh, in the war, and he gets captured. Uh, at, the, at the culmination of the picket Pettigrew assault at Gettysburg. He gets captured right there at the angle and he's put into, and he, and he, and he goes into the, the, the prison system and he finds himself in a number of prisons uh, being transferred for the rest of the war. And, uh, and, and he becomes one of what are known as the Immortal 300, um, which was a group of Confederate officers um, who were actually under fire. They were put as, uh, as human shields uh, to, 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 you know, and, and it's this very controversial uh, a uh, very controversial event that they would go on to commemorate after the war as a small veterans group. Um, and they were very, uh, 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 the animosity was, was really uh, prevalent. So I, I found him because of that, right? I found him because I was working on veterans and I found this guy, Henry Allen, um, who, who had been part of this group called, this veterans organization called the Immortal 300. When I was going through his records, when I was going through his, his files at the University of Virginia, the special collections department there, uh, back when I was a graduate student is when I found him. I found these papers and there's a, a wonderful set of letters that he wrote from prison when he was, uh, when he was in, uh, um, in, in, in uh, a POW that he wrote to his wife, okay? His wife, Sarah, back in Portsmouth. 
And what I found that was absolutely fascinating about these letters is there are a number of things, a number of windows uh, that you can look through to kind of get some insights about Victoria, you know, 19th century life, uh, 19th century, you know, uh, life of a, of a man and a, a married couple, and, <coughs> excuse me, and, and the roles that they play in this marriage, right? And how that works out when he's incarcerated and she's not. And I find really interesting that, you know, he is frustrated clearly because he's trying to run his family, but he can't because he's in prison and he's really, his hands are kind of tied. And so you see him writing his wife and he gets increasingly frustrated, you know, for four letters and then writes a letter kind of, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I was cross with you, the language that I used, I, I, you know, da, da, da. and then he'll like say, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to, to get this money from this person. You need to move to your father's house. You need to make sure that you're not around. And then she just kind of doesn't do it and he gets annoyed. So it's really interesting in this sort of gender dynamic that plays out uh, between uh, husband and wife uh, while he's in prison uh, in, in Ohio and in Maryland and various other places around, around the United States. Uh, so I think that that's, uh, that's it's a fascinating thing. It's also a really interesting insight into prison life for officers uh, who experience prison in a different way. Now, we understand that you know, the prison, prison experience uh, was, was horrendous. Um, even for Confederate prisoners, I mean, we, we typically look at Andersonville and the very and Libby and the various Southern prisons, and, and, and we 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 have the images of the you know the sort of emaciated, the skeletal uh, skeletal figures that come out of that. And when we talk about war crimes, even uh, when we look at Andersonville and that kind of stuff, but you know, conditions were pretty pretty horrible in the United States as well. Uh, the death rates were staggering, um, and he doesn't really seem to experience that in the letters. Now, so there's two things that, the, the two possible things are happening there. One, he's treated better because he's an officer. Two, he doesn't want his wife to worry about him. That would be my guess. Uh, he doesn't want his wife to worry about him. So he is uh, cautious about what he uses. And of course the letters are censored too. So um, he's only allowed to say certain things. He's only allowed to write one page. Um, and, and if he were to you know, divulge anything uh, that was controversial or made the United States Army look bad, I'm pretty sure that they would have uh, restricted that letter. Um, and so there, you know, from, from his perspective, it doesn't look like the prison is really all that terrible. He talks about some people who get sick um, in that, but I mean, he's getting care packages from home or he's at least asking for them. He's getting money from home. He's getting stamps and tobacco and socks and all the kinds of things that he needs. He's getting those shipped from home. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you read it without understanding what prisons were like, you might say, well, this wasn't really so bad, but then you start figuring out, ah, okay, uh, this, what's going on here is, a, a, any number of other things, uh, that are happening because it, it was pretty horrendous, uh, this experience, uh, in prison. He never talks about the stuff that I mentioned being put under fire, purposely put under fire. He never mentions any of those things in his letters. Uh, it's only it's not until after the war that this kind of stuff comes to light and he doesn't write his wife about that or his two young children. It's and in, and in a lot of ways, it's sad because he clearly misses his family, you know, and I think, uh, you know, as anybody who's read Civil War letters, especially a collection of Civil War letters um, can attest to this. It, it, you know, we in the 21st century, you know, well, OK, I, I, I won't speak for anybody but myself. I find that the Confederate cause reprehensible, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, what they they served a nation that was that was in place to uh, to to perpetuate the institution of human bondage of chattel slavery and, and I find that abhorrent in, in every conceivable way. Uh, I don't know anything about why Henry A. Allen joined the army. Uh, I'm pretty sure he understood what the what the issues were, but I, he never says I joined the army because I wanted to preserve slavery. He never says that. He might have joined the army because all of his friends joined the army. And it was the thing to do. I don't know. Maybe he was looking to, you know, to go have an adventure or something. I have no idea why he joined. So I can't make the judgment on him personally, though I understand that Confederate soldiers knew what was going on. Okay. But so here's the thing. My point is, is that I think when you read a collection of letters like this, what you do is you get an insight into the humanity of these people. They're not just numbers on a list, right? That's, they're not just that. They're living human beings who have families, who care about their families, who care about what's going on. Um, and you can't help feel a little bit, you know, bad for these guys when you see that they're going through anguish. They're, you know, they're our fellow human beings and you can see that. OK, so you have to, I think, strike that kind of a balance. And I know there's probably, you'll probably get listeners who will come yelling at me. How dare you care about what a Confederate soldiers? Well, you know, it, the guy was 
it, listen, and I'm not going to let him off the hook and, you know, this sort of cliche to say, oh, he's a product of his times and let him off the hook. No, I'm not going to be that easy on people. No, because they understood there were people against what they were doing. Of course they did. But he's still a human being. And I, and I want to understand this thing. And I can almost, you know, uh, I mean, I can, you know, you, you feel the pain coming through in the letters. I wish I had the other side because you only get the letters going to his wife, not from his wife. I wish I had the letters that he received from his wife. I don't know what happened to him. Uh, and we often see that, you know, the uh, we don't see that we, we only see letters going in one direction. Fortunately, um, in typical 19th century style, sometimes letters would come out of order, right? And so it's all it's very typical for a person writing a letter to say exactly what they are responding to. So, you know, so a, a letter might come up, uh, might say, like, in response to your letter of the 18th, in which you mentioned da 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 da, here's what I have to say about that. So that you get a little bit of what's, uh, what's coming from the other direction. But this set of letters to me is just absolutely fascinating. And I started on a project, I had to put it aside for a minute because because uh, I have uh, obligations elsewhere, but I started on a project, and I'll pick that back up uh, again this summer as well, of annotating all of those letters. And so if he mentions a person, I'll do my best to find out who that person was. If he mentions, uh, you know, any, any event uh, or anything like that, I'll try my best to, to find out what that event is and then annotate it and then provide uh, additional sources uh, that you can learn about that. So when he's talking about his, his associates in Portsmouth, I've gone through the census. Um, I've gone through military records. I've gone through various other things to try to piece together all of his network and his connection. Um, and so he was a, he was a, a, a fairly, I wouldn't say like very prominent person, but a fairly prominent person in Portsmouth. He seemed to know all the, all the people, uh, and he was an officer. So that, that would say something as well. It, um, it seems like there's just so much, um, you know, um, fruit that this, uh, that these letters can kind of bear in terms of, um, you know, invoking themes about like you mentioned um you know prison life experience familiar relations on the on the southern side you know between you know soldiers and their wives back home and also i think what you kind of hit, hinted at was kind of the this the i guess the victorian standards of kind of modesty right that mm -hmm. some of these guys observe and so because there's just so much there i was interested you know have you used this podcast and these letters um in your own classroom and um um, more broadly, I mean, I just like to, you know, get a sense of what you think kind of the, the teaching value to, to these letters are, or just more broadly kind of, you know, translating an, an, an archive like this into kind of this, um, this audio format. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it, again, it, it makes it accessible. And, and one of the things that I found, um, especially with, I, know, I sound like an old person, but especially with the young generation these days, these kids these days, uh, everything's on their phone. Right. And, and they get things in short sound bites. You know, they don't have attention spans, uh, you know, necessarily to listen to long winded things. So uh, the, the recitation of a two minute letter is easy to get a hold of. It's easy to digest. Um, and, and, and this particular set of letters is good because it's very clear in its intent and purpose, really. This, you, don't, you, know, you can kind of tell where they're going with a lot of this stuff. And so if I'm, giving, if I'm talking a letter about you know, the relationship between a husband and wife, there's some, you know, some interesting dialogue in these. Um, or if I'm trying to, to depict what prison life would have been like for a student, there's some interesting pieces. Uh, in this letter, in these letters, that I can choose one or two and say, "Here, go listen to these, or or, or read these, or whatever." However you want to, uh, however you want to digest them, and and, uh, and 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 they're pretty good for that. As are a number of letters, and there's many many sites online that have digitized letters. I'm certainly not the only person that came up with this idea, uh, but there's lots and lots. But but I, I don't know of anybody who's done a podcast uh, exactly. I've heard people talking about it, but reading a set of letters on a podcast, I thought was a, a, a pretty interesting idea. And if there are other people who are doing it, I would love to connect with you and, um, uh, and exchange ideas. Cause I think it's a great way, uh, you know, to, to get through a set, uh, to get through a set of letters like this without having to, you know, listen to it in the car, right? Listen to it when you're going for a walk in the morning. It's a very easy way to do it. And you mentioned, you know, without, without, you know, uh, letting these guys off the hook, right. You know, you're, you're interested in exploring the humanity of someone like Henry Allen. And so, um, and I just I just did an inter, uh, interview with uh, Judith Giesberg about her digital mm -hmm. project last scene and uh, in conjunction with the theater department at Villanova, um, theater department did performances of these um, of these uh, kind of uh, 
ads of formerly enslaved people looking for lo loved ones. And what I found in that, and I think what's similar here with the Henry Allen podcast, you know, there's an effective quality to it, right? Yeah. That you can feel the emotion of the, the individuals. Yeah, I think that's so important. We have to humanize uh, these stories. They're not just blue and red lines on a map. You know, they're real life people. Um, and, you know, another, another uh, and uh, the, the, this idea, the, 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 perf the performative uh, part, we, the reading of the, the slave ads and the performance is, oh my God, that, are, are they uh, searching for family members? Is that what it was? Did I misunderstand you? They're searching for, yeah, that sounds, well, that sounds incredible. Uh, I would love uh, to listen to that and, you know, uh, hear what that, how that, how that comes out. And, and there's another podcast, Addressing Gettysburg, which I think is quite good, Matt Galloway's uh, uh, podcast where he tells the story and then reads primary sources uh, that were written by participants, um, either civilians or soldiers that were participants in the Battle of Gettysburg. It's a very, you know, interesting way to humanize the conflict. And I think we tend to, you know, we, we, we're, we're 150 plus years beyond uh, the actual event. I think the numbers are so are so large that we tend to abstract them, and 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 we forget that you know uh, when you when you start throwing numbers around like ten thousand, twenty thousand, fifty thousand, we forget that every single one of those is an actual person, right? Um, that that and we, and we really need to recapture that. Otherwise, you know, the, so much of the meaning gets lost in this because every one of these people that find themselves, you know, shouldering a musket and marching off to war has a story. Every single one of them does, and they have, they have, and, and they also have a future, a vision for their future. And 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 you know, sadly, somewhere in the neighborhood of 800,000 of them don't get to realize that vision, or at least try it. Right? So we need to know their stories. Uh, one of the things that I do, and I actually got the idea um, uh, from the Museum of Tolerance uh, here in Los Angeles, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, um, where you get a, a, a person, right, uh, like a, a, a card with a person's picture on it. Uh, in their story. And as you go through the museum, you find out at the end what happens to this person. And of course, these are people who were, who were, um, uh, who, who were murdered by Nazis in concentration camps and various other things. But uh, I, I, I got the idea to do something similar to that um, at Gettysburg when I take my students there on a field trip uh, is at the beginning of the trip, you know, we're there for five days. At the beginning of the trip, I give them a card uh, that has the a soldier's picture on, just an ordinary guy, that I, and, and, and whatever biographical information I can get uh, on that person on the back of the card. You know, if they were married, if they went to school, if they had a job, what they did, you know, if they liked, you know, sometimes you can get stuff like they liked dogs or what have you, you know, anything that, that makes, that gives the connection. And these guys aren't much older than my, than my high school kids who are 17, 16, 17 years old. These guys are like in their maybe late teens, early twenties. And so they can relate to them at least at that level. Um, and we go through the, you know, go through the whole motions of going through the different parts of the battlefield and try to unpack the battle and all that stuff. And by the end of the trip, I tell them what happened to their person. Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it really is, it, they often have emotional responses because of course, as you know, a lot of these guys don't make it, right? Or they're horribly wounded um, and they suffer, uh, you know, and they, and, they, and they suffer for the rest of their lives for their wounds or they, you know, or, or, or what have you. Um, but it makes it, the, puts a real human face on the blue and red lines that we look at before we go <laughs> to the battlefield. And, and I think that that's so incredibly important to do. This is what I'm trying to capture with the Henry A. Allen letters. Is this is a guy. Nobody would have ever heard of this dude had I not. I mean, he was his files were buried in the deep, dark archives of the University of Virginia Special Collections Department before they moved it to the fancy new facility uh, that they built, um, you know, towards the end of my tenure as a grad student there. Uh, but nobody had seen these things for, you know, 150 years. And then here they are uh, now published for the whole world to see. It puts a human face on, you know, on, on, on somebody that nobody would have remembered otherwise so i think it's important to bring these stories to light yeah and i'd agree I, that's another a great thing about that is you know it's highlighting the you know what you might call it the unexceptional experience right the, mm -hmm. like that kind of bottom-up history right that these histories yeah. matter that they do tell us um important things about the conflict you know regardless of whether they have you know stars on their shoulders or whatever sure and i'm not listen i'm not dismissing the stories from from above too i mean we need to know the we need to know the all these things we need to know the big you know the, the big political movers and shakers and the big military movers and shakers we need to know all those things as well and so i'm not trying to this isn't like an either or proposition that i'm trying to replace one thing with another um, but i do think bringing these voices in as many voices as you can really 
as, as many of d diverse perspectives and opinions, as many voices as you can possibly bring in, as many experiences as you can possibly bring in, what you're getting is a much more complete picture in the end. Um, and, it, and it's not, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, it's like, oh, it does the uh, top stuff. You didn't, you know, the, 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 that doesn't matter, right? Forget about that. We need to know the real stories of the people on, you know, yeah, okay, fine. You need to know the real stories of people on the ground. Yeah, you do need those, but you have to know the whole thing. Because if you don't know the whole thing, then you're, you're missing out, so. The trouble, of course, is teaching that, you know, because we have a limited amount of time. We right. are nine months in a school year. Where, how are you going to do this? We have to make some tough choices sometimes, but, you know, it's up to teachers to try to figure out a way to balance that. And it's not always easy, you know, because there's lots and lots and lots and lots of different lived experiences in this country, not to mention the world, but since I'm a U.S. history teacher, there are different voices and different perspectives and lots of different experiences. And to, to include them all, I think, is an ambitious, a very ambitious uh, uh, idea and, and, and almost uh, probably next to impossible to do if anybody ever figures out how to do it well I'm you know I'll give you my phone number later and we can talk about it uh, yeah I think the 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 podcasting was a good start though it definitely mm -hmm. uh, eases uh, some of that labor to be, well you have to do the home front labor with the podcast but once you have it right it's, mm -hmm. it's there for you to just to to send people off to listen to which I think you know I, it, you know you can't, again you still can't get everything but it, it makes it easier I think yeah, I've got another set too that I've, I've been I've been threatening to to, to do. It's a labor intensive in the beginning. One because you have to transcribe it, you have to do it, you have to record it. It's it, it is labor intensive in the beginning. Once it's out there, it's out there forever. But there's another set of letters. Um, uh, another Confederate, another Virginian. Um, you know, at the University of Virginia, you find a lot of Virginians, right? Uh, another Virginian, another officer, a cavalry officer, uh, who has a a a, um, a an exchange uh, letter exchange with his wife. Uh, and, and he winds up getting killed uh, in Antietam. Um, and, you know, this, this set of letters, it's, it's really, uh, you know, they, they have a, a really strong connection and their relationship is, 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 a, is a good one. I mean, he, he loves his family. They love him. He's got young children as well. Um, and uh, the, the, the letters between them are rather touching, I think. Um, and it, it, when, when the let, and I was reading through the letters going, wow, you know, you feel like you get to know this family and they're probably, you know, they're saying things to one another that was probably meant to be private. And here I am reading it 150 years later, but it's still, um, nothing racy, you know, just, just like intimate stuff that you say that a husband would say to his wife and a wife would say to her, to her husband, you know, um, and, uh, the letters stopped. And I'm looking through the file, you know, trying to go, okay, well, where, where's the, where's the next, where's next, where's next month, you know, uh, and well, they stopped on, you know, middle of September, uh, 1862. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, you see the letters from his fellow, his, 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 uh, his messmates, you know, writing to his wife saying, you know, we're, we're so sorry about your husband. He was killed leading his troops. And it's like, oh, you know, it's like, you get that, you get that feeling. It's like, man, I, it's like, I, I lost a friend, you know, I, I thought I knew this guy. Now he's gone. You know, it's this, it's it's it's, uh, it's what my um, uh, Joan Waugh, who was my teacher at uh, she 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 um, uh, ran my district my my, uh, my honors thesis at UCLA when I was there as an undergraduate. She calls that the Civil War moment, right? And I, and, and that is my Civil War moment. That moment where I suddenly went, I felt the loss. I mean, of course, I can't. I mean, the person's not related to me. I never met the person. and all this kind of stuff. But I felt that moment of like, oh. You know, the first time that ever happens. I've read about people getting killed, you know, since I was 13 years old. Uh, but that's the first time uh, when I was in graduate school that ever happened. That's when, oh, man. Uh, and I, I, I want to put those out there, too, one of these days. I, I have the uh, copies of the, of the letters in, in my files in the, in the archives. But one of these days, I'll do it. It's a great story. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah. a great story that everybody should know. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm doing a disservice to, to the world by not publishing these letters. I should get to it. <laughs> um. Well, I think as we wrap up the conversation here, mm -hmm. um, you know, for people who are interested in, you know, doing something like this, transcribing letters into a podcast or starting their own interview series, um, you know, if you had some tips, um, recommendations to where they get started, for where they get started, you know, where, where would you point people? Yeah, well, I mean, it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, you know, some folks and, and, yeah, I, no judgments here, but some folks spend an awful lot of money buying super fancy equipment, you know, microphones and, 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 and editing equipment and all the, you know, uh, secret guys, I use the, the head, the, the microphone that came with my phone. Uh, and I, and I use, um, and I edit, you know, just a, a, a garage band on my, 
on my um, on my computer. It's you can do this for next to nothing. You really can. Um, and so to, to the setup is, is, is fairly easy. And, there, and there's lots of, of, of ways that you can, for either a very small amount of money or for free, um, publish your podcast and, um, and it will be distributed through uh, Apple or iTunes or Apple Music or whatever they call it these days um, and, and all that stuff. And, and, and for a person like me who is really, really, really not tech savvy at all, um, it's still fairly straightforward and fairly easy to do this. I'm not a tech guy in the least. Uh, yet still manage to produce a fairly decent sounding, fairly professional sounding podcast. Sometimes with the helicopters flying over, like I mentioned to you earlier, but uh, but 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 more often than not, it sounds it sounds pretty good. Uh, and so it's easy to do that. The thing I would suggest, though, um, apart from the technical stuff of actually getting it to the public, is to you know build yourself a following and and be willing to talk to people about stuff. Um, it's easy to, you know, not all podcasts are created equal, as they say. Some of them are, are fantastic because they're engaging. So think about what people want to hear, you know, uh, think about how that's going to work. And this is maybe one of the reasons why I'm, I'm shifting gears a little bit, um, just because maybe it might be time for something new to see, to see how that, how that plays out, how, how it works, how people will engage. I'm thinking about how, ways to make it better. Not to say that my interview format wasn't good. I liked it. But, um, you know, try some new things and see what happens. So I think it's important to be willing to engage with the public, right? That's a, that's a uh, like sort of rule number one, be willing and eager to engage with the public, get yourself a presence online, a social media presence. Um, Twitter has sort of been the thing for a long time for me. I know that, that Twitter can be uh, frustrating for a lot of people because um, as, a, as a scholar that I was speaking to, uh, not too long ago, described social media as ignorant armies clashing by night. And I thought that that was brilliant. Uh, it was a private conversation, so I'm not going to say who it was, but it was a very prominent scholar who said that, who said that which I thought was pretty, a pretty apt description. Um, but uh, so it can be frustrating, but it can also be rewarding too, because if you, if, you, if you sort out all the noise, then you can actually find some good stuff on social media. So a social media presence uh, is important. Uh, you know, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram are, are kind of the, the three amigos there, but there's lots of other ways. Um, uh, John Heckman, the, the, the tattooed historian, uh, is, 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 is a great example of somebody who's willing to go into avenues that a lot of other uh, scholars and historians don't do, you know, so he, he'll be on, you know, uh, playing uh, video games and things like that and talking history while he's doing it online. So he has some interesting ways to do it. So there's all kinds of ways to engage the public, which is my point. Um, and I would be willing to do that, build up a presence, build up a following uh, and be willing to work with people. And, you know, also you, you have to pay your dues a little bit, you know, uh, you're not going to publish one episode of a podcast and suddenly have 10,000 downloads. It's just, you know, uh, and there's a lot of podcasts out there right now. So there's a lot of competition. And I think, uh, you know, over the pandemic, over the last year, now the year plus, you know, lots of people found themselves with a, a good deal of time on their hands uh, and begin, hey, I know I'll start a podcast. So there's a zillion podcasts out there. Um, and uh, so you've got a lot of competition. Um, so that's something else to consider. So that means you need to separate yourself from the crowd a little bit. And how are you, you need to think about innovative ways to talk about this stuff. And I mean, that's, that's really kind of how all this got started in the first place. Podcasting was an innovative way to talk about history with the public, as was blogging was an innovative way at one time to talk about history with the public. And new things will come up. I mean, there were, in the old days, there were like chat boards and forums and things like that on various websites. And who knows what's coming next? I'm, I'm very interested to, to find out you know, what that is, but there'll always be something. So be on the lookout for what's coming new and don't be afraid to push yourself out on the limb and try to be innovative uh, and interesting. That's, that's what's key, interesting. All right, so this is the website. This, you can find the website at keithharrishistory.com. And when you type that in, you will get this landing page, which of course is the, is the very famous uh, image uh, of the Battle of Antietam. It's one of my favorite uh, my favorite pictures from the Civil War, and I find this to be a very striking, uh, striking way to open up a Civil War-related uh, website or a history-related website. Anyway, just click enter. You see all my uh, my links to all my social media down there below. Just click enter, and you will get. If my internet is going to work for me today, there you go. Come on, slow but sure. There it is. Okay, so you get to the page, and you'll have a number of uh, a number of options. You can go about it in two ways. One, you can scroll up and down, and you can see what I'm doing in the classroom. Uh, you can take a look at the book reviews that I'm going on. 
The Gettysburg experience is something that I've done specifically uh, about that battle because I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I take my students there on a field trip. And I think Gettysburg is a particularly interesting, uh, partic particularly interesting place uh, to, to you know, have the, uh, the sort of physical uh, experience uh, of history uh, coupled with classroom work. And then of course, you can ask me questions, ask Dr. Harris as, the, as my students call me. You can ask me questions about things and I'm liable to actually talk about them. On my, on my website. So anyway, there's the podcast that we've been talking about. So there's the Rogue Historium, um, uh, which we've mentioned. There's the, uh, the letters of Henry Allen. And if you click on those, um, you'll see that you can go through and look uh, day by day. And each one of those letters has been you know, transcribed here and then annotated. Here are a number of footnotes, maps, various things, uh, records that he's talking about, all that kind of good stuff. All right. And if you want to look at 2020 year in review, there it is. Uh, here are all, I think I did 44 shows uh, last year in the year 2020. So you can, you can click through all of those and see what folks have been talking about. Here's my blog where it all started. Um, sorry about my light going out. Here's the blog where it all started. And you can um, just take a look at my most recent, uh, my, my most recent post there. I've been talking a lot about monuments uh, these days. My current project is, is sort of unpacking the meaning behind union monuments. I know people are talking a lot about Confederate monuments these days. But it turns out the Union veterans had something to say about their experience in the Civil War, too. Go figure. Uh, but I've been talking a lot about Union monuments on the Gettysburg battlefield uh, and what they what they said in the dedication speeches and things. And you can find my comments on other issues uh, that are related to the Civil War. I talk about, you know, uh, Confederates who moved to Los Angeles, which is my my hometown. I talk about what they're up to. Um, you know, I, I have opinions on things such as the 1619 Project, which I know uh, has been controversial. Uh, uh, and, and I talk about why I actually use the 1619 Project in the classroom, uh, because I think it's something that's actually important. Again, go figure. Um, and there's all kinds of other things. So there's a little section I did on YouTube here called Office Hours, where people ask me questions. And look, there's Kennedy. I'm a Civil War historian. What do you know? But here's Lincoln and various other things that I've talked about on YouTube, where uh, students have asked me questions and I've gone on YouTube to put up a three or four minute video on that. And of course you have all my links to Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff too. Uh, if you wanna see what I'm writing, here's my publications. Uh, there's my, my book, Across the Bloody Chasm, um, Cold Harbor to the Crater. That's a collection of essays uh, that was edited uh, by Gary Gallagher and, and, Carrie, uh, and Carrie Janey. Um, I got an essay in there, and here's a, a recent thing that I did with the Kentucky Register. So you can see what I'm writing about, uh, pretty straightforward stuff. So there you go, uh, keithharrishistory.com. I, I look forward to you guys coming on, uh, making some comments on what you see on there, and I'm looking forward to talking to you about it. All right, Keith, um, thank you so much um, for, for joining H of Water Day and talking about um, both your podcast and your website. Um, it was a really great conversation. Um, so before I let you go, um, where can people find the podcasts and where can they also find you on, on the web? Okay. Well, first of all, Chase, thanks a lot. I mean, I really enjoy talking to you too. Uh, this is something that, that I'm, I'm very passionate about, as you can tell. Uh, and, and, and I've enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed the conversation myself. So if you want to find me online, you can go, it's very easy. You can just go to keithharrishistory.com or if you want, you can go to the rogue historian.com. Uh, and both of those will take you, uh, take you to the website where the podcasts and all the other things are right there in one spot uh, for you to take a look at. If you want to find me on Twitter, uh, I am at M, like the letter M, uh, Keith Harris, at M Keith Harris on Twitter. And I'm on Instagram at Keith Harris History um, on Instagram. So easy to find. And that's where I'm doing most of my stuff. I'm on YouTube and Facebook. I don't go to Facebook all that much anymore. And, um, you know, you can find Keith Harris History on YouTube as well, uh, which I put things up there from time to time but twitter's my main spot uh and instagram is my main spot so please join me there and we can talk about history anytime you want all right well thank you again keith for for taking some time today and um thank you to everybody who 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 uh tuned in and watched uh, this week's episode